going to, I know you have so many years of experience as a teacher, but I, at this, uh, at the start of this discussion, would like to draw on your experience as an administrator, as the vice principal of Ladies College. Now, with the onset of COVID-19, as I was saying earlier, overnight schools have to be shut down, um, and teachers were uh, suddenly uh, required to find new ways of doing their jobs. And administrators, those who run the schools, are now also trying to suddenly make the shift from the classroom to some kind of online platform. Uh, what, in your experience, has been the greatest challenges that you have faced as an administrator in this process? Um, yes, thank you, Mokshini. Um, uh, as we understand that in the national context, of course, that there are a lot of schools that are not able to get online, but us based here in Colombo, uh, the international schools have been, uh, with these got online, but for our national schools to start, it was the backend stuff that suddenly in a month was a challenge to set up, to find a safe platform, to set up accounts and passwords for the kids in one go because we uh, decided to get all our kids on board from two plus down to eight over to 18 in one go online. So the back end stuff was humongous, but uh, and the technical things, understanding. But on the positive side, I think basically getting online itself was easy for us because of the fact in the last two years we've got used to having smart boards in our classroom and presenting our information. So we have kind of a blended in, uh, learning situation. So for the teachers, it was easier, but they had to be trained on uh, Microsoft Teams itself to get online. Which, so all of this backend stuff in, in a month uh, happened, but it was a little easier for us because we had that head start, I think, by having our teachers already used to technology, being on a smart board and all of that. But the backend stuff of creating accounts and the technical stuff, I have to say, uh, you know, took, uh, have we had us working late into the night and have all the kids actually log in in one, uh, in a day or two, uh, passwords, the technical stuff, this thing was a bit of a nightmare, but uh, it was good that we jumped into the deep end and got it going, yes, so... Yes, thank you, ma'am. I think also that would give me the opportunity to flag the fact that um, it's not everyone in Sri Lanka who has access to online learning. Um, over 50% of children in Sri Lanka actually have had no way of continuing their education through online learning because quite, quite, I mean, if I'm to put it quite, uh, 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 you know, crudely, it's because of poverty. Um, and those of us who come from you know a particular social uh, background are sometimes unaware of this fact um, and we need to appreciate the fact that uh, those schools who do have access to this and have the resources have made this facility available to their students um, so that's the background that we're coming for uh, from and um, having uh, stated quite clearly, uh, uh, Deepika, the, the, the challenges you have faced in making this available to your students. I think uh, teachers and parents alike need to appreciate the work that goes into this. So let me just also flag at this point that even though we're talking about online learning, um, the reason we're talking about it in this discussion uh, is because we're trying to use online learning the best way we can to benefit our children. Um, and that is the reason for this discussion actually uh, to be held today. But having said that, we must not forget the fact that there is a vast majority of children in this country who do not have access to this facility. Um, so uh, on that note, I want to um, now speak to um, Tamara, Tamara, now, um, <laughs> suddenly these children um, have gone from uh, had the, their familiar surroundings of learning in school to having to adapt to this new reality of learning at home. And I use the word learning, quote, unquote. 
right? And we will we'll actually touch on that later on in the discussion. Um, in your area of expertise, you study the science behind learning. Uh, what is the, the psychological process that a child has to undergo when making this shift from learning in a classroom environment to learning at home? And what are the challenges you see these children having to face, uh, not just children, parents, teachers having to face as a result of this? Um, thanks, Mukshini. Um, so one of the things to establish earlier on in this conversation is nothing about this situation is normal. Uh, this is a highly stressful, a very different type of stressful situation, both for parents uh, and the entire country as a whole. And obviously children are a part of this, but they, all may, they may not always um, react to stress in the way adults do. So one of the things I constantly, it's been fascinating, part of my job, or most of my job is listening to children talk about their learning process. It's been fascinating listening to them talk about what this online platform is to them. Um, and one of the things we need to establish is these are not normal times. Children are overwhelmed uh, because they do absorb a lot of the social cues that we give them, particularly if you're in a household where there are, you know, multiple changes that needed to happen to make online learning possible, children are very, very susceptible to that. So with children, it may look like them being irritable, um, being moody. If you have a teenager, they may start retreating a little bit into their sort of devices. Uh, with younger children, it may look like they are being very clingy. Uh, so all these are what we call stress responses. Um, so there is some kind of normalized process that has come into be, but it is definitely not normal. This is not a normal environment for learning. Uh, so that, so and the, the, there was a dilemma in the online platform because when schools closed early on, uh, you know, children started getting used to it and sort of enjoyed staying at home and then suddenly started getting sick of it. And it was at that time that schools got ready and got all their online teaching full on board. So it was a bit of a dilemma where the children were at, at the time online learning sort of got underway because obviously schools needed time to sort of set it up and when the children were exposed to it. So children were coming to that end of this very abnormal sort of atypical situation. So there was a lot of exhaustion and then add to it, school comes in with their program and so now there is sort of a bit of an overall stress situation um, in, in children. And that's what we saw from the time um, schools shut down. Um, and I, I, I'll address some of the ways to help parents. And, but I want to just focus on a very important fact that online learning cognitively, when we think of cognitive science and neuroscience, the brain works very differently when you learn on an online, online platform. So if you don't understand what is happening in the brain of a child as they are learning within in this sort of platform, we are going to find ourselves in very overwhelmed situations and very frustrating situations for kids and parents and teachers, which makes the learning process almost obsolete. So I think there's a very important discussion we should have in this platform about what happens to the brain of the child. So just to quickly summarize, one is in an in a online platform, there are certain amazing affordances, but also very serious limitations. One is we don't have um, social cues. We don't have any physical cues unless this very remote platform. A lot of learning in schools happen because of that social learning, social emotional learning. So that is almost completely taken off. Um, and the other part of it is um, that in the online, there's a lot of subconscious processes that go out when you're learning. So in a classroom, you don't have to tell the child, take your science book out. When they see another kid, the other kids sort of preparing for the next class, subconsciously the mind gets ready for the class. We lose all that. So we lose a large amount of social learning when we are on this platform and that causes a lot of stress on the brain because the brain has to now focus. So it's like an, a good analogy. It's like you give a child a large bowl of soup 
and you give them a straw to drink through it. So the brain is sort of like having this very limited tool to organize their entire learning process so there is exhaustion. So one thing, um, so I'll quickly summarize so that we can go to questions quickly, is pace. The pace of learning online is very different from one-to-one -one learning. Uh, the brain has only a cert because a lot of the other social and cognitive cues are shut down on an online platform. Often um, children struggle with this limited repertoire of interacting with learning. Uh, so if you don't pace your lessons, uh, I see some timetables sent from schools. It just looks like the school timetable only with half an hour gaps. It's probably not the best. It's going to overwhelm children. It's going to overwhelm because the brain is not, I mean, it hasn't adapted to that type of learning. Uh, the second thing is memory, right? So if you want to learn, you need to have your memory. How, how information is processed online is not how memory is processed in general face-to-face uh, -face teaching. So one of the things you may find in your children is though they may engage in a class somewhat, they may not be able to retain a lot of things. So it may frustrate some of the teachers because they may not be retaining a lot of the information uh, that was presented to them through an online media. And then obviously the child is then also overwhelmed because if you refer to a lesson that was done last week or yesterday, they may not have the full uh, capacity to, to remember. And the other one is analysis and application, right? How students analyze and understand what has been said through a screen or through a study pack is very different. So considering these three major aspects of learning, the online program, there's a lot of research done on online learning, and we know that the brain processes it differently. So unless we understand the psychology of how the brain learns on an online platform, we may get into a lot of, um, we'll have a lot of overwhelmed children, overwhelmed teachers and overwhelmed parents. Uh, but there is a way out of it. There is science uh, around how we change the platform in ways that actually promote learning. But I wanted to just start off by saying the cognitive processes are different. So if your child is overwhelmed or um, are not really engaging in the task despite how well you may have uh, prepared your lesson online, there is a reason. And I want to also just quickly mention that there is about a 10%, like a 10% of students who do really well online. Uh, and there's a reason for that as well. So maybe I'll address it later, perhaps in a question, but there is a group that does really well online and there's a reason for that. Um, and we can talk about that later. Thank you, uh, Tamara. Um, Sumaya, I noticed you I noticed you smiling when uh, Tamara mentioned that uh, because of these changes, you have a whole set of overwhelmed teachers. <laughs> so I think maybe perhaps you can identify with that group. Um, I think you're on mute, Samaya, if you can unmute your mic. Can you right, hear me? lovely. Yeah. Yes, I can hear uh, you. Yes, so first things first, I think uh, we all have to remember that this situation started just two months ago, though it feels like forever. Yes. Uh, and um, for me, of course, um, I have done a few things online, but never to this depth. So uh, overwhelmed teachers, uh, definitely, uh, because um, we have to use a completely different method of teaching. Now, um, uh, one thing is to sustain the interest of the classroom uh, and also to um, to uh, set a few boundaries. Now, for example, I had to tell students, please leave your mobile phone uh, in another room. Uh, don't even keep it on mute. Just don't have it next to you because suddenly you see this child, you know, rotating towards something and you know he's typing a message then don't use the chat, uh, focus on the screen. So I, I find myself sometimes giving more instructions uh, while being online because that physical interaction is not there. And uh, as a teacher, I love face-to-face -face more than anything else. I mean, I, I enjoy this job tremendously. So this has been a, a huge challenge for me too. That's one. The other thing is, um, uh, having a grip on the students. Now, if you give them uh, homework to do, uh, if they don't do it, 
they just don't do it. And you have no proof whether they have done it themselves or whether their parents have been there uh, writing everything for them. I mean, you can't go running after the parent and say, uh, who has done it? I have had cases where it's obviously not them who have done it, right? But I, I'm, I'm guessing that until things settle down, we are going to have to be extremely flexible and um, charm our way into the student's interest until it becomes the new norm. Because a lot of parents have asked us and friends of mine who have children, when are we going back face to face? And I don't know. I don't think anybody has an answer to that. So, uh, yes, it has been very, very difficult uh, and tiring. And there's Zoom fatigue. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Uh, the teachers have it. The students have it. Any school that's putting a child in front of a computer for more than six hours, please rethink as parents. It's up to you to question. Uh, because even though your child may be staring at a screen, you can ask them what the teacher said, and I can guarantee you they won't know. Their mind is wandering, and they are probably sleeping with their eyes open. So uh, I would say uh, as long as we are going online, I I'm sure Tamara, Tammy would agree with me. It's not the quantity that counts per day. It's more the quality. And also... Um, us as teachers, we are a lot on the spot now because when you were a parent, you dropped your child at school and you left your child there for six hours. You didn't know what the teacher, barely knew what the teacher looked like or what they produced in class. Now you have a grip on that. And uh, so we have to make an extra effort because we're doing everything th through a screen, which is not easy. Um, and also use whatever avail available tools are. So if I may just quickly say, something has also changed in the method of teaching. Um, we use something called a flip classroom in any, any organization, any institute where you're working, where the child has to do a lot more work alone. Because your screen time is limited to 40 minutes, 45 minutes, um, you can't actually have a student in front of the screen doing a dictation or writing an essay. What a waste of time. So that has to be done at home uh, in the best possible conditions, sent to the teacher, and actually the discussion should be what happens online. So the student becomes, in a way, more um, independent. Uh, I think uh, I have not taught in local schools and I myself were educated in France and in the US and I just spent three years in Sri Lanka, not in a regular normal uh, local school and we were taught to think independently a lot. Uh, information was not given to us so I have a feeling online teaching encourages that where a student has to learn how to think more, research on that computer that has to become their best friend and, uh, and actually present their work to the teacher uh, so that we can discuss it as a group. So it's, it's like a reverse situation where the teacher is not handing over the notes to you and the lesson, you have to really think more uh, simply because if you do it online, you're just wasting that online time and there's nothing more monotonous than sitting down and reading something in front of a blank screen or writing your essay during those 40 minutes. So a lot has changed. Uh, technically for teachers, I'm useless. Technically, I learn something every week. Uh, I wanted to show a video to my students using my laptop and the first two minutes there was no sound. Uh, so then I figured out how to switch it on and we were able to do a listening, uh, a listening test, uh, a listening project together. So um, I think we have to maximize the technical things available, you know, having a teacher with a whiteboard at the back, there's a whiteboard on Zoom, but if you want to work things out, it's good to maybe invest in one, have it behind you so that you can write on it. Uh, but it's, it's a learning curve for everyone. But um, uh, technically, physically, everything, right? So I think patience is what we would require from parents. And, uh, but I'm sure in about a month or two, we'll be all, you know, with it. We'll be able to handle everything. And uh, uh, my special kudos to the administrative side of schools because they have had to do so much to get us started, set up platforms. Uh, that's possibly one of the hardest things. So that's it for me. Thanks, Maya. Yes, I think um, 
you know, I don't think that that's the whole thing. You use the word useless, you know, but that can hardly be said uh, with regards to any teacher because, but then a teacher, some suddenly a teacher who is extremely successful and engaging in a, in an orthodox classroom setting now suddenly is faced with this challenge of having to replicate that experience for their child whilst their children are behind a screen. And as you correctly pointed out, that uh, being physically present with your children uh, is a completely different dynamic, right? So teachers who hitherto before did not have any, uh, who perhaps were lacking in their uh, ability to present online or the use of technology, their presentation skills, you know, all of a sudden they're, they're scrambling to acquire these uh, these skills. So it's it's almost unfair to expect such high standards from teachers. Um, but I, I think that that is something that everyone, the children, parents, administrators also need to take into advisement when uh, moving the, the teaching from the classroom environment to the online setting. Uh, which brings me to my next question to uh, Deepika. Um, one thing that Sumaya touched on is this whole aspect of the parents' involvement in the lessons. Um, on the one hand, uh, it is impossible for the teacher to be as involved in the child's um, lesson as the teacher used to be in the classroom. So because of that now, a lot is, has to be, uh, the teacher has to rely a lot on the parent. But it's a fine line, isn't it? On the one hand, you rely on the parent to assist the child. And you also perhaps need to have the parent to uh, uh, supervise the online time that the child has. But on the other hand, you don't want the parent to be too interfering in the child's learning experience. Um, can you please, you know, give us some insight on how you feel this can be addressed? And if you can just help teach uh, parents to kind of ascertain what would be a healthy balance between not getting too involved in the child's uh, lesson, but at the same time, assisting and facilitating the best learning experience for the child. Uh, yes, thank you, Mokshini. In the sense that, yes, especially with younger children, parents uh, have to be involved in the sense that they have to be help the kid to log in, they have to uh, be there with the child in some sense. But uh, parents keep forgetting that, uh, you know, learning has to be independent, right? So most often you would have sometimes a parent interrupting the teacher, uh, forgetting that they are not part of the lesson, that it's their child who's part to the lesson so uh, it took a little bit of getting used to sometimes uh, uh, and also where you know the they're, they're supposed to actually assist the child to log in and be in the vicinity just to ensure there are no technical glitches but not be sitting right next to the child trying to help them to copy their work or commenting give this answer or do whatever they have to remember they don't do that in the classroom they drop the child at school and they let the child learn. So it's very important that they do this also online. They have to let the child learn independently. And but yeah, especially with the smaller child, they have to supervise. But on the other side, also with parents going back to work, uh, I find that sometimes that uh, the safety aspects for children is not as addressed. Also, parents also need to ensure that the that the giving them this technology they need to put in uh, safety requirements for the kids because and also having specific times that they you know stop using the technology after the lesson you know not just be surfing online so we also are trying to bring in that aspect for, aspect for the children to uh, age appropriately about digital citizenship what you know what their responsibility must be online but plus making the parents also aware with helpful links on on safety uh, but uh, making sure that they don't interfere with the child's learning process uh, and their over enthusiasm of wanting to help just you know leaving the child to be the independent learner I would encourage the parent to do that
Okay, thank you, Deepika, for that. I think that is something that actually uh, came up a lot in the questions that were sent to us uh, during the time of registration. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to once again remind you that uh, at the moment we're taking questions that were sent in to us earlier. Uh, we have collated them and uh, we have uh, divided them up into broad areas so that our speakers can tackle them. We will be, there are quite a lot of questions that are coming in via chat. We will do our best to address every one of those, but they will be taken on a, a first come first serve basis, so to speak. But that too, Amber is working behind the scenes to collate those questions so that um, all of your questions, if possible, are addressed, even though they may not be taken individually. Um, I would like to also encourage you, if you by any chance, um, ha uh, have your mics not on mute, kindly place it on, put it on mute so that it will be only the speaker who is heard. And you can go ahead and even uh, switch off the video on your screen if you so wish to. Um, you can perhaps listen to what's going on while carrying on with uh, your work at home. But please feel free to switch off the videos also on your uh, screens if you wish to. Um, Tamara, uh, my next question is to you. And it also uh, is also a kind of uh, building on the observation of uh, Deepika on uh, screen time. Um, now, I know you're not a medical doctor, but um, uh, in your experience, um, how um, adverse an impact does too much screen time have on a child? Um, I know for a fact that there are certain schools that actually have uh, their school day, like any other school day, start in the morning and they end at two in the afternoon. How effective is this, A, and B, how good is it for the child, psychologically, mentally, um, physically even, emotionally? Um, please, if you can help our parents to understand this, thank you. Um, yeah, so we, we have a couple of concerns with uh, overexposure to screen time. Uh, Part of the reason is how the uh, learning process itself takes place. Uh, so, you know, it, you'd, you'd find it really interesting that, you know, typically our kids are very uh, screen friendly, right? They love their gadgets, they love their, their YouTube video and video games. So then the question is, how is it that they are able to engage meaningfully in a platform like that with a screen, but not in learning? And that's because the video gaming industry knows a lot about how the brain works on a screen and what to do in order to keep their attention going. Yes, is overexposure to the screen too much? We have talked about Zoom fatigue uh, because like I explained earlier, a lot of the ways a child learns uh, through interacting with their peers, uh, through physical cues the teacher may give, like proximity cues, uh, because all those uh, modalities are shut down, the on-screen time, less is more. If you want to do your entire lesson for 40 minutes on a screen and you're going to talk at children like you would do in a regular lecture, uh, you are not going to be successful. Uh, and the child is going to shut down, like I said, because the brain is processing online information differently. So you can't just take your, um, your regular curriculum, put it into some kind of PowerPoint-like format, and then talk through the entire lesson to the child. Uh, so you can't do what you did in the regular class. You have to modify the content, and you have to modify the way you uh, deliver. If not, what we are going to see is, so we know when kids watch TV for a long time, there is a peak where their attention is kept and then they, their brain goes into a lull. It just gets fatigued. And then toward the end, they pick it up. But now the difference in watching a cartoon or a movie is that no one is asking you to recall that information. You're not going to be tested on it, nobody. So what we know from, from research is children generally engage in this with the screen that way, with like an initial really strong bond to it, a general lull of, mm, I, I mean, they don't need to remember every detail of the movie. And then, and then if you ask them how the movie was, they'll be like, oh, it was good. And give you like two, a two minute, like it's a good movie. That's how the brain is used to working with screens. That's what they're exposed to. So, 
when we talk about screen fatigue and is really learning happening, keeping your kids on a screen from eight in the morning till six is not going to work. I mean, you may feel better that, oh, my child is like occupied or the school may feel like, okay, we've got our syllabus covered. But if you ask me if learning is happening, learning is not happening. Uh, learning is happening very minimally. Uh, so one of the things is if you are to, so there is a health hazard in the sense that you're just following a cycle where children are just disengaged. You're just wasting a lot of data and a lot of teacher time just trying to keep their attention and you can't, you don't have social cues. So there are different ways though. So what, like I said, what we've learned from the video gaming industry in cognitive sciences and learning sciences is how to keep their attention and how do we modify content? How do we modify delivery? And how do we do that in order that they get that optimal time? And it doesn't necessarily look like six hours of Zoom staring at a teacher just talking to you. Um, so, there, so there are multiple ways to do that. And like I said, like I think Sumaya touched on it too. This is a great platform where you can use a lot of what we call multiple modes of representation. You can teach the content using videos, you can use images, you can direct kids to other reading materials. So I'll give you an example. I am um, in the national school system. Uh, one of the one of the the tenth grade sixth chapter is about um, sort of uh, the history chapter has an area where they talk about queens who are who were queen like who were leadership positions for women and you know in teaching that you could just read the textbook which we have asked the teachers never to do even in a regular classroom. Right, so there are a lot of malpractices in the classroom that teachers try to replicate on screen. Dictating notes. We have told, we have told teachers many times there's no research showing that dictating a note to a child is going to help learning. If you spend 40 minutes of your regular classroom reading a note to a child, you are, the child is not learning. I mean, there is a wonderful machine called a photocopy machine. You can use that to give kids the note and you can spend more time instructing. You can't read the textbook. The ministry is very clear, the publication department, that this is only an additional reader. So, but if you, now twice I have been supervising uh, two sessions. Now this is not the majority of teachers. These are only some, so let me be very clear. Um, reading the textbook online and giving notes online. You can just put it, you can just take a, type it out or take a, you know, there are multiple ways to do that. Um, and so those, the one thing good about this is it's going to push teachers to actually do some instructing than just reading off the textbook or just copying down, uh, copying down notes, right? Um, so, so multiple modes, you can use videos. Oh, and I was saying about the, I found a raw media um, write-up online about Sri Lankan queens. Um, and I asked one of the stud students that I'm helping, uh, he, he, he has some difficulties in learning to just go read that. And then I gave him all eight past paper questions from the past four years that addressed that content. And he was able to answer it just by using the details given on that other media platform. So there are multiple ways you can, you can do a 10 minute Zoom introduction and give children tools to learn. And this will make it so much easier on parents too. So if you want to learn about physics, right? About how atoms move, you tell them there is a link on TED Talks that has this amazing thing. So parents will also be like, oh, you know, actually a TED Talk, even I don't mind sitting and watching with my kid. You know, so you, can, you have to change the content. You have to change your delivery. If not, we are doing the same thing to kids. We are just plopping them in front of a screen and they are not learning enough or what we think. So the danger in using all these amazing technology and misusing it comes when we don't change the way we teach and what we teach online. And that's the biggest psychological mental health threat because if you don't do it in, a, in the appropriate way, children are going to get in overwhelmed parents are going to get overwhelmed because they are not trained teachers they don't know what to do with the material uh, and so 
you have to change how to do it. And maybe if we have time later, I can address, give some tips to teachers and parents on how to make it work. Actually, I don't mind you giving us those tips now, Tamara, if you yeah, okay. have it so on hand. Yeah. yeah, so quickly for teachers, you, your key word has to be accommodate. How can, what am I teaching? What is it? What is the skill or knowledge that I'm leaning? So isolate what that what is of lean learning and look online uh, for material that teaches the same thing. Uh, and you can find this material uh, like through, multi, so it's called multiple means of representation, a video, a poster, anything that generates discussion on, on your online platform is a good mode to use, right? So in, in Universal Design for Learning, we call it multiple modes of representing the same information. So typically, you, if you're teaching a lesson, you have to have at least three ways a child can access that information. It could be a pre-recorded lecture. So you pre-record your lecture, which means the child can listen to it whenever they want. It doesn't have to be live. You can do an online lecture, and you can give them reading material or a TED talk or some link or Khan Academy to go and learn the rest. So you have to, you have to think of it like I have now given my student three ways to access this piece of information just other than sitting and listening to me on Zoom. That's, that's one thing. The other is experience. I told you the only way you can learn online is you have an experience. So or, what are we asking? To, students to do writing 10 page essays and just or writing worksheets worksheets and study packs are inadequate you have to give them multiple means of short so basically asking the child show me what you know show me you've learned what i've told you so kids can do writing tasks if they want they can do short videos they can do posters so you have to basically ask how can I give my student three or four ways that they can show me that they've learned this content? It does not have to be a test. It does not have to be a worksheet. Are those options? Yes, but only option. Can the, you know, if you ask uh, one of the students in the primary uh, grades was doing a flowering plants and one of the teachers that I was working with told him to take a four, like five photographs from his garden of all the flowering plants, plants and explain it to the teacher. That's an excellent way than making him write a book report or like a 10 page essay on flowering plants, right? So multiple means of students representing what they have learned and giving them choice. If you don't give them choice in this really very messed up social situation in their learning, and if you don't let children direct some of it, you are, we are failing as adults. We are failing. And this is sad because we already know what research is telling us that works with kids, right? And then we choose to ignore it because the easiest way for me to do the class is to just read the textbook online or just keep talking at them for 40 minutes. Um, it's not learning isn't happening. So your question should be, what am I teaching? How, what are the ways that I can help teachers? And that gives options to parents too. So you tell the parent, the child can either do this, this or this. You pick, this week may be a really busy week for you, just pick what it is that your child can produce this week. Then next week, maybe you don't, you can help your child a little bit more. Okay, then you pick the other way. So you kind of give parents also options of what work needs to be done after a Zoom lesson. So unless these two things come into play, parents won't be able to meaningfully engage with their child's education and neither can teachers. So the tip is to always find three ways for teachers and for parents and simple things like doing Q and A's with parents, right? Just before you start, you just say, okay, 10 parents together, what are your questions? Here is how you can do it. Um, and having meetings with parents, but letting children direct their learning is the best thing we can do for them during this really stressful time. And it's very doable. We just need to start thinking about learning differently and give parents options too. Because sometimes a parent, most parents are working online. Most parents are putting more work hours now than their regular nine to five job. So it is extremely stressful when they have to sit with the child and figure out what they learned in that Zoom class. And then there is this study pack to finish. 
But if you give parents also, you know, he doesn't need to do the study pack. Maybe you can get him to do a video recording of what he learned about atoms, a three minute video. Kids love those things. They love to do these very innovative things. And if you just create the opportunity, this actually may be like a really big turning point for learning and teaching in Sri Lanka, if you, if you do this right. Indeed, thank you. Um, necessity is the mother of creation and whenever we find ourselves in a situation where we have no option, we adapt, right? That is, that is what we as human beings do and I think teachers have mastered the art of adapting and, and, and as a, um, because it's a vocation and you're driven by passion, you find a way to meet your, your children's needs, your students' needs. Um, on that note, Maya, my question to you is, yeah. there has been um, a question that has been sent in on, um, I think it also draws on what Tammy was saying as well. Um, are teachers expected to replicate classroom learning? Is I truly, it support? Is, are, I truly are, are, hope are not. Expect, okay. Yes, I truly hope not, because that would be uh, just not possible. For one thing is, uh, it's not the same situation. Uh, and I think uh, I should bring in the fact that there are students with different abilities in every classroom, which is, uh, of course, much easier to deal with when you are face to face with that child. Um, I'm going to like uh, in general, right? I, I don't want to say in the French school or at British Council. And I was at Elizabeth Moyers until 2016, but then I went to British school. So it has been different, different experiences in every school. Uh, so in a classroom, you can put one child a little bit aside and give him more attention. Sometimes you have a teaching assistant, even if the kid is uh, above a certain age he or she can go for ESL English as a second language class if he's having difficulties, he or she. Now on Zoom, all that goes away. So um, the replication of a regular classroom clearly cannot happen. Uh, so we are faced with that challenge of having one classroom with people who have different uh, learning abilities or learn at a different pace, I would say. Um, there are those who cannot focus, those who have to uh, desperately type something on chat and say hi, 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 hi to their friends and not knowing very well that I can read it or use emojis uh, and those who uh, dominate the conversation. So once again, it's a question of management. So it's an extra, extra stress for the teacher, muting the mics, showing them how to lift up the hand, uh, saying that's the only emoji they can use. Um, also, I would suggest that if one does have some serious, um, you know, concentration issues, in that case, we have to be flexible and allow the parent to be seated next to that child. And uh, because you just cannot be the disciplinarian here, but once again, it's about leaving all your uh, little extra mobile phones and iPads and stuff aside. So that would be uh, the only thing you allow the parents. So again, flexibility is important. Uh, so no, it's not the same at all. I love face-to-face -face teaching. This is extra, uh, you know, a learning curve for everyone and maybe more stress as Tammy said, uh, definitely more stress. Um, and we have to be more creative as teachers to make the 40 minutes worthwhile, interesting, not have people wander off and fall asleep on their screens or you know when a child is not focused, right? You can see them looking at you, but they're not really looking at you. Uh, so I would say the teacher is, uh, it's a new challenge. It's like learning a completely new skill for, for the teacher also. Um, again, I think you asked me very quickly to touch upon the unfairness of uh, the fact that we don't have, uh, a lot of the kids don't have the um, equipment uh, to deal with, uh, to have a class. So uh, we need to be aware of that. Uh, uh, personally, I have come from, a, when I was in France, state education where everything was provided for for free. And then you come here and there's this huge divide between the local schools and the international schools. But believe it or not, even in some international schools, there's one computer per class, per, per home. 
and uh, the parents are juggling. So in that case, my only thing would be those who are lucky enough to have computers or a decent smartphone and cannot attend class. It has happened to me uh, with recently. Uh, be nice and do the class again. Uh, it's your um, it's your Wi-Fi. It's uh, definitely your electricity and Wi-Fi bill. What to do? But uh, again, we need to be kind, and if we can afford it, uh, do the class again. For if it's one child or two children, try to put them in groups. But uh, and also make sure that the reason that they couldn't attend the class for is. Uh, real. So just a small thing, my method of teaching with uh, the little school I teach at the French school is that I scan if I want them to read something or do uh, homework before the class. Uh, it may sound a bit controlling, but I want to make sure they receive it. So I scan it. I, I'm lucky to have a functioning scanner behind me. And I email it to them and to their parents to make sure that nobody says, I didn't get it which is generally uh, what you hear. So there's double proof that it has been sent. And as uh, Tamara said, I've changed my method of teaching. I play games with them very often. Um, I send them uh, riddles to solve as like a little warmer before the class starts. I've asked them to research songs and listen to songs. But the latest class was about the Beatles. Uh, so some 12 year olds had never listened to them before. So to listen, there's something poetic about those songs too. So those, if I was in a classroom, I'd probably not do that, but, um, it's just to keep it going, you know, and hopefully when we'll be all more comfortable, we can go back to, uh, more regular, you know, less creative things, or maybe we'll have to continue. But as I said, the, the technical thing is something that really bothers me in Sri Lanka. It's, uh, we must never assume that there are three laptops per home. I have a friend who teaches at a school, if I, you don't mind me mentioning this, she teaches triplets. So there are triplets in the home. One in, uh, one who's eight, no, sorry, one who's 11, and the other one, 12, the two, no, no, sorry, sorry. one, one daughter is 12 and the triplets are 11. Does that home have four laptops? Probably not. So uh, you have to, it's a rare situation, but it happens. So I would love everybody to have the online facility, but it's not realistic. So I myself have wondered, and I don't know if there's an answer to this, but the worksheets, worksheet method, the worksheets are not corrected when they're sent. How can a teacher correct piles and piles of worksheets? Uh, so it's, it's still full of question marks, I think. But my main thing is, if your school is asking you to be online for six hours, it's not going to work. So that's up to you to, I think, Ladies College has done a brilliant job. Ms. Deepika said that it's two hours max or three hours max per day, that's perfect. That's absolutely perfect and that would actually serve a purpose. So that's about it. The technology needs to be worked on. How we lesson plan is a lot more work than face to face and, uh, and patience from all sides because we are still learning uh, whether it's the kids. Kids are very quick with technology, but we are a bit slower, I think. So that's what, that's what I would say really. Mokshini. Thanks, thanks, Maya. I wouldn't uh, mind. To, I wouldn't mind being a part of your lesson on Beatles. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> sign me up. <laughs> um, okay, my next question because we are um, we are a little pressed for time. Something that has come up a lot, um, and I'm going to direct that at uh, um, Deepika uh, because of her experience and knowledge in this uh, area, is about homeschooling. Now, several parents have uh, written in saying that actually their children are showing uh, better progress after the learning was shifted to the confines of the home. Um, and so they have asked whether continuing this is actually uh, good, whether we should continue with this way of learning and whether homeschooling is something that should actually be developed and introduced on a larger scale. 
uh, homeschooling does have its classes. I do agree in some ways, but uh, I basically think learning is um, uh, also uh, I, um, one of those questions was that they, uh, you know, they were hid in their knowledge, acquiring of knowledge. But uh, learning is not just about acquisition of knowledge. Uh, the interpersonal uh, skills that a child develops is very important. And modern uh, education is what they believe are the four pillars of learning, uh, critical thinking, communication, creativity, and collaboration. So if your child is not able to collaborate and develop and strengthen their interpersonal skills by interacting uh, and uh, you know just being homeschooled, you deny your child. Uh, homeschooling, I think, would be good in, very, uh, in, in special circumstances but uh, of course uh, the the whole point of school of doing things together the experience I mean in our national schools uh, we have uh, assemblies together worship together we do so much things and the kids learn they learn about disappointment they learn about failure they learn about you know getting along with disagreeable people they learn on hands uh, challenging situations I mean you cannot get that in a home school right so so yes, if it's knowledge based and if it's just about academia and a bit of extracurricular, yes, you can do it by homeschool. But learning is not that. Learning is about life living. I mean, values so much more, right? And that whole experience. And as Maya said, even for us as teachers, you know, you a kid would come, they would want to talk about something they've experienced at home, share about things, and you know, having that lifeline is very important. I think in life so i would say regular school is very important being physically present homeschooling maybe yes uh, i know countries like the us who have uh, uh, developed a, a stronger base of homeschooling and they have kind of a movement but i think in a sri lankan context i would stick with the regular schooling option because of all the pluses that it carries uh, uh, you know uh, for children in, in, in their social skills and in their development Thank you, Madam. Uh, one a question that has come in through the chat is, is actually homeschooling legal and permitted in Sri Lanka? And can children sit for the regular uh, exams like O-levels and A-levels after having only been homeschooled? Uh, they are permitted to sit exams privately, yes. So if they leave school, uh, they can sit uh, privately the examinations. Yeah, they can do that. Thank you. Um, Tamara, uh, some of the questions that are coming in now touches a lot on what uh, uh, Deepika also mentioned on the importance of interaction uh, with other children and how important that is for the overall development of the child. Um, if you can just touch on this aspect as well and how parents can best help to uh, fill in that gap or whether even that is even possible. Um, that is one aspect of the question that I'm going to, because in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, pose two questions to you. That's one. The other is children who have learning uh, disabilities, okay, developmental uh, uh, difficulties. Um, some of them actually have found it easier now with this online system, right? And, and a parent has very specifically mentioned that asked whether this can't be continued, right? How can can actually uh, learning online be an option for children with learning disabilities who are in the, the mainstream schools, but can a special program be introduced to help them to, to only take a few subjects perhaps in school, but the other subjects which they find challenging to be done at home with the assistance of their parents. Sorry, I know I've lumped two questions which aren't directly connected, but I'm doing that in the interest of time because we have only about 15 minutes more. Okay, so I'll answer your second question first. Uh, yes, so like I said, there is about a 10% of students who are doing well on this platform. Part of them don't have disabilities. Uh, we know the characteristics of children who do well online platforms are those who are very self-regulated already, who needed very minimal supervision with their learning prior to schools closing down. Uh, 
also children who have different paces of working who 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 can self pace how they learn and when they learn some skill development there uh, so yeah so there is uh, but here here is the i think there is a model that we can follow into the um, into when school does reopen there are models called flipped models where students are given because i think i want to be very clear on why students don't succeed sometimes in regular classrooms it is often to do with a very strained relationship with their instructor or their teacher it may be due to the large curriculum it may be due to the the sort of the interpersonal reaction relationship with the teacher particularly if you have had struggles in school with attention to behavior to learning you name it right uh, and also because schools typically don't uh, uh, feel like they need to accommodate kids who are struggling in the school system in the regular classroom they would rather relegate them into some unit to get some special help and i and i am uh someone who supervises those units because it's almost like a necessity to support these kids and the other thing is things other psychological issues like a lot of discipline issues a lot of punishment used in school a lot of bullying happening in school so a large group of children i work with during regular school are children who are reluctant to go to school they have anxiety issues they have they find it overwhelming to keep up with the classroom so obviously you move them into a place where all those stresses are taken out they're going to do well um but the the solution is not just to put the kids who are doing well into an online platform and the rest to follow it's about how do we accommodate the regular education school system to make sure these other children are benefited because it is not i mean some maybe about 1 to 3% have diagnosed disabilities but in every class i go you can talk to experienced teachers about 10% struggle to just keep up with work as regular and then what are the accommodations you bring in so some of the things i discussed earlier like giving kids photocopied notes spending more instructional time than reading off the textbook being very flexible with what they are expected to do right so a child who is doing really well and loves the subject can do a 10 page book report but for the kids who can only engage with it in a minimal level you can do a 3 minute video talk on the book you were just read so giving kids options is one way we can make sure all kids are accommodated but and in the same way we can continue the online platform so let's say there are kids who have some very serious neurocognitive physical disabilities so coming to school every day may cause fatigue so for example children who have cerebral palsy may have difficulties in coming to school and sitting through that school day for 6 hours because they have their physical disability doesn't allow it we can give them the option of uh online learning but not exclusively like we have to accommodate them in the regular school while making online learning an option so let's say a regular student who has no problem was listening to a lesson a literature lesson in class today you know he got like she got like 30% of what the teacher said but like 70% was sort of off if we keep an online platform going and we have pre-recorded lessons they can always log in and listen to that lesson again so we can accommodate so many and we know from research anything you do for the least successful child in your class whatever a teacher does to make sure the least successful child in your class uh is supported all the other students grades go up by 30% this is research we know this anything you do to accommodate the most struggling learner in your class you can increase everyone's performance by 30% we know this so it's not about making this like oh they're not doing well in school so we'll just send them to online classes because interaction is so important children being uh, particularly children with disabilities feeling like they're a part of this society is important and schools bring that up so online schooling is an option it has to continue to be an option not just for children with disabilities per se but all kids who want some additional support we can do it it's been done um and yes so there is a value in continuing this modality but not exclusive for any particular group because then we will be excluding them from regular school which is a dangerous thing to do um 
um, Tamara, just touching on the need for uh, physical and inter interaction uh, yeah. for children with peers. Uh, if you can just yeah. mention so that, one of that the has thing... featured a lot in the questions that have come. Yeah, so one of the things is physical entertainment and interaction can't be uh, entertained in a pandemic situation, right? There is a public health risk. Uh, so even if you do small classrooms or do a group, I mean, I, I read some work which was really good about doing these little smaller classrooms, but this is a public health hazard and we need to be very mindful that this is not a time when like a regular curfew due to political unrest, this is a, like a, a public health crisis. So teachers can in, encourage interaction through the phone. Um, you can have students talk to each other on the phone. You can relegate 10 minutes of your online Zoom time for kids to talk to each other. Allow chats, allow them to chat while the lesson is going on. It's okay because all kids, even if you were teaching face to face in a 40 minute class, they were interacting in other ways or losing their, and that's a normal, that's a, that's the, that's the process of the brain. It can't just focus intently for 40 minutes on anything. The brain is not wired to do that. So creating some space for interaction or say you say, okay, today I'm going to do a 10 minute lesson and then I'm going to let you all in your little groups, you know, talk to each other via chat, you know, or doing smaller group lessons, you know, uh, instead of doing 40 minutes at a stretch, you do 10 minutes with 10 kids and you allow a lot of interaction with the kids. So you can, I know it's very limited and it's not great, but because we are in a public health crisis, we need to be protecting uh, uh, the, the, the physical movement of our kids, but you can use the platform. You know, like I said, video gaming has taught us this, right? Kids game online and they have a lot of friends online. It's not always safe, but we can use some of those principles in our teaching and how we run the online class. Do we give like a 10 minute chat time for kids over the phone? Like talk about what you learned about and send me a picture to send me a, 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 a screenshot of all the chats you had about the lesson you learned. It's an excellent way for children to keep engaging without having to sort of, you know, interact in a very adult, um controlled way it's okay to give them some flexibility kids kids can do this if you only give them the chance they know how to interact in appropriately sometimes without i mean you kind of jump the gun and think oh my gosh if i give my child the phone he's going to like no you've been given the phone to chat with five friends about the science lesson you all did and you just need to take a screenshot and send it to your teacher so now they are interacting so you can put some controls in it but don't assume that kids are going to you know, we, in, in our culture, we have a sense of always assuming the kids are going to do bad things and going to misuse. And we have a culture of not listening to kids, not valuing their opinion. And in a pandemic situation, we are creating a, like in 30 years time, we will have a generation of kids who, um, who felt extremely constricted in their learning. So I love it, trust kids, listen to them and let them lead. They have to lead uh, some of this conversation this time. So yes, so interaction can be allowed within even a structured lesson. Uh, there are multiple ways to do that um, and you just need to bring it in. You have to be intentional about allowing interaction. Intentional being the key word. Thank you, Tammy. I think you, I know the mics are muted, but uh, you had some applause also from the audience on that. I think uh, oh. uh, a participant, Tarsini Makandu, gave you a round of applause. Um, I think a point has been made by one of the uh, uh, attendees that we have to make a contrast between pushing down information to children, um, which, is, which, which, is, which has been the go-to method all these years in Sri Lanka. And as you said, uh, Tammy, this is a perfect opportunity for teachers and educators and parents and administrators alike to, uh, to revisit the traditional methods of teaching. And at the end, who knows, through this pandemic, we might have a new generation of children who are creative, who are more broad-minded, who are innovators. So, you know, this could be a blessing in disguise um, if we play it right. Quickly, the next question to Sumaya, there's a question directed to you. Uh, in your opinion, what is the maximum number of students that should be allowed in one session of teaching you know, during a lesson? 
Okay, so uh, <clears throat> if it's a Zoom lesson, and I'm going to sound like a really international school teacher here, because I know it's not the same for uh, state schools and local schools, but I, th I think if you really want to have some form of interaction, a maximum of 12, 12 to 15 maximum. Uh, my classes with eight are super. I have a fantastic time. It starts to get a little bit harder with 10, 12, uh, but I know it's not realistic in most contexts. Uh, it's that or the schools. I mean, I know some, some teachers teach 50, 30, 40. My, my own nephew is in uh, a, a local school and there are 40 in his Zoom lesson. And uh, you can just imagine what's not happening during that lesson, right? So um, ideally it's that if you want the 40 minutes to be of some use, I, I think you have to limit a little bit because if not, it's going to become just a lecture and uh, from the teacher and then the students won't be able to discuss their papers, their answers, their, you know, it's, it's bordering on like a tuition class, actually. It, it becomes something closer to your tuition class, but ideally it's that, you know, and I can see even in universities, uh, those who are doing their masters online and uh, my, two of my sisters are lecturers, uh, they don't have more than 10 in a class. Uh, so I know it's a bit different school and uh, college, but still, uh, so that would be really the ideal scenario. But I know that even in international schools, uh, which I formerly were part of, uh, the Zoom lessons go up to about 20. So I think if you know your students well and there are 20, then that's all. I mean, you have no choice. Uh, the ideal thing would be to cut the class in two. Uh, but what happens is when the, the more students there are, students online, and then it becomes way too much of uh, screen time for each and everybody. So fee, ideally between 10 and 15, ideally. Okay, thank you, Samaya. Um, Amber, do we have time to take one more question or is it possible? Should we wrap up now? I'm gonna... Do you want to take one more? Then we can yes, I, th there is one question. Actually, um, I would like to direct it to uh, Deepika. Just very quickly, something that the parents have mentioned is that now with the children being at home, there is this assumption that children have more free time. And parents also, because they have to work from home, uh, it is assumed that the parents have more time to spend with their children and to get involved in the children's learning. But in actual fact, Parents are also struggling with having to work from home. In fact, some of my friends say that they, they work almost 24-7 after this lockdown because the assumption is, okay, you don't have to travel. There is no set start time and end time. You can work from home. Is that something that you have experienced uh, with the LC going online? And how have you addressed this? Uh, yes, very quickly, uh, Mukshini, actually that was a reason for us to really stagger our timetables uh, because from 2 plus to 18 to give them a daily experience of classes, but at the same time as uh, uh, Sumaya uh, referred, we, didn't, we don't give more than uh, uh, two hours for uh, 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 primary and uh, seniors get three hours uh, maximum time. So staggering it also uh, being uh, conscious of the fact that parents have to do their work online uh, and also the fact that they have to run their houses and attend to household shows um, um, not being in front of screen uh, we had a, a global speaker two years ago plus dr lalit mendis who constantly talks that they should not be in, in front of a screen for more than one hour at a time the medical uh, impact on that bearing all of that in mind we spread it out like we we start from eight in the morning then we go on till night but it's it's very staggered per grade. Uh, that was a way that we felt would best address all of these situations. And also the fact is not to uh, pile the kid with stuff. It's just because at home, as you said, it's not just free time for us to just, you know, pack in, uh, you know, uh, academia or, you know, studies into it, but also to make it more interactive. Uh, as Maya said, we have become creative. We, uh, you know, even for the primary kids, if it was a lesson, a poetry lesson, something to do with it, 
dog and we actually use our household pets to show the kids or <laughs> you know you know the, you did the fun things so i think you have to use the fun factor in learning though you're online uh, but don't be too harsh on the teachers also parents because teachers are also trying they are also juggling their own families their own homes they are, and they have daughters who are also there there are siblings and as sumaya said there are no, uh, everybody in the house doesn't have a computer so sharing of technology so all of that we try to accommodate we're trying our level best so uh, i think being kind and patient and accommodating is very important in today's context and uh, tamara's um, uh, input so much that you know the for, for the child also giving that space and making them you know uh, really sort of you know apart from the medical aspect you know inter interacting with them in a, in positive ways at home manage maybe a little bit more planning of your time for parents i suppose but uh, how they manage you know screen times and their own personal times is important yes Thank you very much. Um, I would love to take this opportunity to thank our panelists, uh, Mrs. Deepika Dasanayake, Sumaya Samarasinghe, and uh, Dr. Tamara Handy for taking time off their busy schedules to be with us today. But uh, the official wrapping up will be done by our wonderful hostess here, uh, Amber, who is uh, who was the brains behind organizing this event on behalf of Mums in Colombo. I would like to. wrap up as a moderator uh, thanking all of you ladies it has been a, a, an amazing experience for me i have learned much about online learning it will help me with my uh, teaching online as well with the drama and i am so grateful for the opportunity i am mokshi jaimana thank you so much for the opportunity i am the over to you your mics on mute okay thanks mokshini um of course we've gone over time and we knew we would because there's so many more questions is coming in and i i think we would have had another hour of talking and we would but we would all be suffering from zoom fatigue as sumaya said so we're going to stop it here um thank you again to all the speakers of the tamara deepika sumaya because i i just texted you guys and you just came on board and thank you for your enthusiasm and i mean really the work that's been put into this in the at back end and thank you mokshini because you had no reason to take this on <laughs> with all that you have going on so it was very sweet of you to offer and of course i want to tell you that i'm not the brains behind this so i want to thank tanya tranchel because she's the one who initiated this and pushed me to do it um i just want to say that in march we would never have imagined that we have missed almost two terms of school and uh, this would be an important enough topic for us to kind of discuss and this is not the only discussion there's so many discussions going on about online school so we do have to appreciate what all the schools have done without much preparation they've had all this you know up and running and no advance notice and more than that the uncertainty you don't know when it's going to start again and when you're going to have to wrap this up what parts of it you're going to take going forward um how we will restart when we will restart exams international exams so all of that is a learning curve for schools as well as teachers as well as parents um but through all of that i think we also have to appreciate the kids who've had to adapt and i think it's 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 not fair to say that it's not working for one kid or because it's not their fault like dr tamara pointed out there's so many things that are involved in this it's not just the kid it's the way of learning it's the number of people involved it's the home environment it's the vibes that we are passing on to our children so i think from a parent point of view we really just have to the idea behind this was just to be able to discuss this objectively and kind of take some learnings from the ex experts in hand and just you know go back home and think about what we're doing right what we're doing wrong and if this is to become the new normal then what are the things we need to change because clearly we do need to change a lot in terms of the class sizes in terms of the way the education is imparted it shouldn't just be a you know a tick on a check box to say okay we finished this term it should actually contribute to the learning of these kids so um just take that forward take that thought and you know i we've had so many positive comments and thank you for the wonderful audience because we have just so many questions it's been <laughs> mokshini gave me this job of filtering all the questions to her and i'm sure she's really like angry with me about <laughs> the way it just comes through but anyway thank you very much for being a part of it and we'll wrap it up here thanks so much okay bye